Welcome to session 10 of Become a Millionaire. So this is session 10 of 12. So we have two more left. So I really want to thank all of you for sticking with it. It's been, it's been a long time. And, and when we started out, there were a few more members and uh, you guys are hanging in. So thank you. And I appreciate it very much. So I ran out of poems. So I had to go get something from the Bible. So this is one of my favorite um, uh my favorite passages from the Bible. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. It's from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's called the Eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if I was to add a beatitude, a ninth beatitude, it would be, blessed are they who help others for in their time of need, they too will be helped. So that's hopefully what I've been doing for all of you. So here's the agenda for this month. So we will quickly review last session, which is session nine. Then I'm gonna go over cut expense 25%. That's the last cut expense session. Then I will go into expand wealth 25%, talking about individual stocks, module three. There's actually two sections to it. The first section is how to analyze stocks. And the second session is what analysts focus on. So we'll, we'll get more detail with that. And then I'll give you an update on the BAM account. We'll review the session and we'll talk about the last two sessions of the year. So with that, let's review session nine. Session nine is when I completed CEO of career, which included uh, reviewing steps one, two, three of module one. Then I presented module two, which was steps four through seven. And I presented the last three steps, eight to 10, which was module three. So that's uh, that's the end of CEO of career and also completing augment income up to 25%. And then last month, we continued to expand wealth journey. <clears throat> and that's when I did individual stocks, module two, which covered all the TV stations, the websites, newspapers and subscription newsletters for uh, for helping pick stocks to to um, investing. So the homework for last session was to go back and review sessions six and seven. Uh, so we, uh, six was to expand wealth 15%, seven was augment income 15%. And then you were supposed to work through uh, steps four through 10 and become CEO of your career. You're supposed to begin looking at the websites, newspapers and the apps. And then finally you were supposed to research some of the potential newsletters that I talked about. So let's jump right into cut expense 25%. So before I do that, we haven't talked about this since uh, like session four. So I'm gonna review some of the cut expense slides just to bring you up to speed. So. Back in session one, we talked about uh, all the expenses that can be reduced. So we talked about you know, cable TV, cell phone, insurance, car payments. We talked about converting your rent to mortgage, you know, eliminating credit card interest, and trying to reduce your income taxes. So that's what we talked about in session one, just to give you a flavor of what cut expense was all about. And then session two, we, we, we jumped into it and we talked about cut expenses, save 5%. So uh, talk about the age old adage, which is if you take care of the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves. And then we talked about cutting expense in order to contribute to your become a millionaire account, your BAM account. And then uh, the amount you're trying to save is a percentage of your annual income. So uh, you're supposed to go through the, the homework session one and identify all the expenses you can reduce or eliminate. So that's what you were supposed to do in session two. And we also talked about your, where you were on the cut expense uh, spectrum, whether you were at 0%, you know, 5, 10, 15, or 20. Um, so that's basically what I talked about was uh, 
trying to save at least 5% and depositing into your become a millionaire account and doing before session three. And then the example I had was that if you're making $50,000 a year to cut 5% would be 2,500 a year or about $200 a month. So that's pretty modest. So hopefully everyone was able to do that back in um, February, which is when we talked about it. And then session four, we talked about cut expense 10%, moving up from five to 10%. And you do that by buying a home. And three of the benefits of buying a home contribute to cutting expense. You know, one is building monthly savings. You know, if you could um, have monthly uh, uh, expenses that's less than your rent, then you can, in fact, build monthly savings. You create tremendous tax benefits from the interest you pay as well as any taxes you pay. And then finally, because you have a mortgage, you know, you no longer have month, uh, annual rent increases from your landlord. So that also contributes to cutting expense. And then in session six, we talked about your income taxes and how that can be reduced by focusing on certain things like uh, trying to reduce your um, your gross income or just gross income. And you did that through retirement accounts. And you also did it by reducing your capital gains. And we talked about harvesting losses. So all that would contribute to uh, the next step up in, in uh, cutting expenses. And then, okay, so, it, so disposable income is your gross income less your fixed expenses. So your, as your income increases, disposable income increases also. So I'm just giving you an example here where you know, your, your fixed expenses would be the rent or mortgage, the car payments, student loans, the federal and state income tax. So assuming those are you know, roughly the right numbers, your fixed expenses would be about $3,150 a month or about $37,000, $38,000 a year. So in order to cut expenses to, to save 15%, you have annual income of 60,000, fixed expenses of 37, eight. That would leave you with about 22,000 of disposable income. And if you can save just 9,000 of that 22,000, you will have achieved cut expense 15%. Similarly, you know, if you were able to get augment income 10% over a two year period, your income would then go to 72,000 your fixed expense would go a little higher to 40,000, but now your disposable income is actually 32,000 and you would need to, to save 15,000 in order to reach the 20% level. And then similarly, when you get to 88,000, which is basically 40% over a four year period of increase in gross income, your gross income would be 88,000, your fixed expense would be 45,000, that would leave you 39,000. And if you were able to save 22,000 of that 39,000, you have achieved 25%. So the bottom line is this, as you augment your income, which we've talked about, the ability to cut and save 25% just becomes that much easier. So that's the bottom line. So that's what you have to do to cut and save 25% of your income. So let's move on to expand wealth 25% individual stocks module three. So this has been our roadmap all year. So we started with what I call investing baby steps that was expand 5%. Then we went to expand 10%, which was buy a dip, which would improve your returns. Then expand 15%, we talked about uh, financial advisors, asset allocation, and really the risk return equation for um, making investments. Then last month we talked about, oh, I'm sorry, two months ago, we talked about individual stocks module one, which I started to talk about individual stocks. I gave you an overview of that. And then last month we talked about TV stations, websites, newspapers, and subscriptions. And then this month we'll talk about uh, module three, which is analyzing stocks and making investments, which is today. And then next month we'll finish this module off with buying individual stocks which is uh, margin accounts, order types, uh, bid ask price, selling short, and an introduction to options. So that's what we'll do next month.
So just by way of review, you know, if you want to get 20, 25 average returns, you, know, you have to get beyond the ETFs and move to individual stocks. And as I've mentioned, you know, when you get to individual stocks, you can make more money, but it's much riskier. So you have to uh, spend a lot more time learning the material, doing the analysis, and selecting stocks. But if you master these skills, uh, the rewards will be greater than if you just stick with ETFs. So at the most basic level, uh, the basic assumption that I, at least I make, that most people make, is that if key financial metrics increase over time, then it's very likely that the price of stock will increase over time. So that's the assumption. It's not always true, but I would say 80, 90% of the time, it's true. So things that you're looking for would be things like earnings increasing over time, earnings growth percent uh, growing over time, contribution margin growing over time, revenue or revenue percent growth growing over time, market share, market share percent growth, assets, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of things that you look to grow over time. And analysts who recommend in investing in a particular stock is making an assumption that these, you know, some set of these metrics will increase over time. And they also believe that management of the company, you know, like the CEO, the, the vice president, are all very important to achieving these metrics, both good or bad. So um, good management leads to good metrics, you know, not such good management leads to not such good metrics. So that's a basic assumption, and that's uh, what fundamental analysis is all about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the things we talked about last month, but I'm going to talk about it in a slightly different way. So let, let's talk about um, Motley Fools. These are a couple of the, the uh, uh, this is one of the services I, actually, I subscribe to that I talked about next last month. And then you know, just by way of, of um, review, uh, this company was founded in 1993. Uh, the two brothers are co-chairman, Tom Gardner and David Gardner. And they employ about 300 people worldwide. So that's one of the values of, of investing in the newsletter. You know, for $50 or $100 a year, you get the benefit of the research of 300 people worldwide. And this was the report from uh, some somebody who tried uh, Motley Fools from 2016 to 2020. And you know, they recommend two stocks a month. So they invested in uh, 24 stocks a year for the last five years. And the return that they enjoyed, uh, so 85% of them were winners and uh, they had a very, very significant return. So I guess they were did 224% over the four or five year period, which is 81%, I'm sorry, 81% was what the S&P 500 was. So they almost tripled what the S&P did uh, with the 224%. So that's Motley Fools and this was, this is their investment thesis. So they believe that you should buy and hold stocks for at least three to five years. They believe you should hold at least 25 positions. Uh, their view is you're really buying a business and not buying sort of a, a piece of paper. And so you should really evaluate like a business that you own. They're very focused on having a sustainable competitive advantage. You know, if you are in the market and there's something that you do very well that others cannot approach, then that gives you a, a, a competitive advantage. So that's really a market share metric. So they're basically saying that they will hold or at least expand their market share every year. Brand advantage. So we talk about, you know, example would be like Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble. These are very well-known companies that have significant brand advantage. So if a newcomer comes along and they try to compete against them, they're not known. So it's much easier for a Procter & Gamble and a Coca-Cola to maintain, expand their market share and their revenues given the brand advantage. Having a technology advantage means that you know, somewhere in the technology, they are superior to their competition. That actually gives you three advantages. You know, your, your superior technology will lead to a market share uh, um, advantage, a revenue advantage, and an earnings advantage. 
they also look for companies with a network effect. So an example of that would be like Facebook. If you were, if there were like, you know, 10 people on Facebook, it would not be very valuable because you have no one to connect with. But, you know, they've gone from, you know, 800 million to over 3 billion users. So almost everyone's on Facebook. And the more users get on Facebook, the more the, the network effect uh, is in play. So that obviously helps their market share and helps their revenue. Scale advantage. So there are certain things that only larger players can do. So an example here would be like Amazon. You know, Amazon is able to do a prime members who can get free delivery. That's the scale advantage. If you're starting out, you can't afford to pay, you know, whatever, uh, you know, FedEx or, or UPS charges. And they also have next day delivery. So those are things that Amazon is able to achieve because of their scale. They talked about companies that have legally enforced monopolies. So the idea here is that because of the way the laws are set up, uh, you have a pseudo monopoly and other people cannot infringe in your space. And that's obviously very good. And then they're obviously very focused on cash on hand and they're focused on management. So these are the things that the Motley Foos looks for. Uh, these are the metrics they look for to increase over time. And that's why they recommend the stocks they recommend. So this is really the way they approach investing, which I find very solid and uh, it's a very good approach. So I've talked about Louis Navalier before, but I've never really spent time introducing him. So I'm gonna uh, take a little more time to introduce Louis Navalier today. So um, stockadvisors.com, which is an independent website called Louis Navalier, the one advisor whose track record sits at the very top of long-term performance ratings. So that's a very impressive uh, quote from Stock Advisors. And the Hubert Financial Digest you know, evaluated 20 years of performance. And they said that Louis Navalier is the number one performer uh, from 1985 to 2005 uh, among 32 newsletters. And then finally, uh, uh, Hubert also said that from 1985 to 2008, that's a, so like a 23 year period, you know, their investments have resulted in a 2,156% gain compared to 869% for the S&P in that same time. So that's again, very impressive uh, return. So Louis Navalier was on um, Fox Business just a few days ago on September 29th, and I thought that this was a nice clip to show you. Jimmy, right now to weigh in is Navalier and Associates Chairman and Founder. Louis Navalier, also Louis, good to have you. Thanks very much for joining the conversation this morning. Where are you in terms of all of these threats or risks uh, to the market, whether it be the uncertainty in Washington, yields moving higher, the beginning of the Federal Reserve's tapering, uh, slowing the economy? Well, I'm very uh, relieved, to be honest with you, because yesterday at the close, we saw a lot of buying pressure. We also saw spreads tighten. So what happens during fast market conditions, uh, spreads will often widen, especially ETF spreads. And they really tightened up at the close. And they were certainly stocks that were an oasis uh, there like the, the dividend ETFs. So that's a good sign. Now our friends at Bespoke have documented that when you have more than a 2% correction in the S&P since 2020, uh, that the average performance the next day is 1.59% up and the next week is 3.59%. So we're gonna get a bounce. I think the close is gonna be very crucial today. I'd like to see some buying pressure. We normally get good uh, quarter and window dressing on um, on the 30th, which will be tomorrow. So uh, I think it's time to go bargain hunting. And um, and if you wanna be extra cautious, just uh, wait till October uh, 18th to get invested because obviously we want the debt ceiling to be lifted. I think we have three weeks to buy in dips, to be honest with you. And I just uh, think we want to be invested as we approach October 18th. They're going to lift the deficit ceiling. I mean, I can't imagine a scenario where they wouldn't, okay? And uh, there's enough infighting in Congress now. But, you know, Chairman Powell will calm everybody down today, okay? And he'll remind everybody that inflation is transitory. And uh, I, I realize it's um, it's still very high, and there's we have very high energy prices, for example. But uh, the stock market is an oasis in an inflationary environment, and that's it's either residential real estate or the stock market. 
and the earnings are going to be much stronger now because of all the inflation. So I thought that that was a very relevant clip. It was only from September 29th, and uh, you know, Congress is arguing about raising the debt limit, and that should happen by uh, October 18th. If it doesn't, you know, that will be that will be a challenge. But anyways, I thought that that was a nice introduction. So just like Molly Foos has their uh, metrics or things that they look for in picking stocks, Louis Navier has his own ideas. And it's there's a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. So what he looks at is what's called positive earnings revisions uh, by Wall Street analysts. So um, almost all companies, the Wall Street analysts will say you know, they will you know, make so much money uh, for the current quarter. And if during that quarter they raise that number, that's called positive earnings revision. Um, now, when the company actually announces the earnings, if it's above what the analysts are saying, that's called positive earnings surprise. So that's two of the things that Louis Navier looks for. He looks for analysts you know, giving positive earnings revisions. And then even with the revisions, uh, the company's getting positive earnings surprises. Those are, are very good. Um, so the, the theory is that the earnings um, expectations are already baked into the price of the stock. So you know, if the company is supposed to make, let's say, $2.50 for the quarter, that's already baked into the price of stock. If they end up announcing $3 instead of $2.50, then the price of stock should go up because uh, $3 was not priced in. So that's what that's what you talked about, beating earnings estimates. Uh, increasing sales over time, that's pretty obvious. You know. Expanding operating margins is similar to expanding uh, contribution margins, so that's a similar one. Uh, he believes in free cash flow, and we'll talk about that later, but that's basically uh, how much cash the business generates. Uh, earnings growth, we've talked about. A positive earnings momentum, that's really a rapidly growing earnings, and then return on equity. So those are the eight things that Louis Navalier talks about. So having seen those two companies, so. I think these are things that are generally important. So your market cap, your revenue, your market cap divided by revenue. So that's really like, like a, a, a market cap over revenue metrics, almost like a price over earnings, over revenue metric. I look for revenue growth, earnings per share, earnings growth, and price over earnings. So again, if uh, the key expectation is that these metrics in a particular stock will grow substantially over the next few years. That's what you're looking for. If you can find companies where you believe you know, either all or many of these metrics will go up, then it's very likely that the price stock will go up too. And that's what we talk about analyzing stocks. So given these metrics, how do we discover the metrics of stocks that you're considering? So I'm gonna use Apple as an example, AAPL, as, uh, to, to walk you through it. So if you search for AAPL uh, in, this, in the um, search bar, you would come to uh, this screen, which is, it's actually a longer screen. So this is uh, the, the top part of it. And as you can see, it tells you, you know, what the price of the stock is. Um, it tells you, it gives you a chart. There's actually a three-year chart for the, the stock. You see it a little dipped here, went up there. This was the COVID uh, dip. That went up and yeah, it's obviously doing doing pretty well. Um, uh, look at this dip here in 2018. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then if you if you raise the the website up, you get the snapshot two. Snapshot two gives you a summary of the news and events for the company. It tells you what analysts think. You know, it could be a 10, nine, you know, all the way down to zero. And the average rating for Apple right now is a six. And then you know, it tells you, you know, what, what sector and industry they're in, and then if there are any research reports you can find. And then snapshot three gives you the CEO, the chairman, number of employees, so Apple's 147,000 employees. And it shows you what the, um, the metrics for Apple are compared to the industry and what their percentiles in industry. We'll go into this more detail, but you get all of this on the snapshot page, which is the first page uh, when you search for a particular symbol. So 
So the links that I think are most important is the news and events. Obviously, snapshots important. The news and events is important. Key statistics is important. Earnings, dividends, and financial statements. So I'm going to walk through each of those quickly. So this is the news and events. So it's always good to see what current things are going on with the stock. You know, are they announcing new capabilities? Are they um, trying to raise more money? So all this will give you a up-to-date view on how the company's doing. And then this is a slide one of two with the statistics. And it also shows you all the valuation statistics. This is much more information as when there's a snapshot. Then there's growth statistics. Um, you know, you can see that uh, last quarter over a year ago, so their earnings per share went up 100%, which is quite impressive. So that's available. And then there's three more sections of statistics. There's one on profit margins, there's one on returns, and there's one on debt. So every company has these metrics online. Uh, they, this is the Apple web, uh, this is the Fidelity website, but you know, your brokerage should have similar information. So if you click into earnings, you can see the gray bar is what the earnings estimates were, the consensus estimates. And the dark green, I guess, is the earnings results. So you can see that in general, Apple exceeds the consensus estimates. That's very good. So that's one of the things that Louis Navalier looks for and uh, seems to be growing the amount that it's exceeding the estimates. And then these are estimates for the last two quarters that you know they haven't announced earnings yet. But when they announce earnings, it will show up here. And then there's a thing called dividends. So certain stocks, when they certain companies, when they have a lot of money, they return some of it to the investors. So you know, Apple is, is $1.42. And uh, right now their dividend is 22 cents per quarter. So you can think of that as 88 cents per year. It's basically a dividend back to you. So in addition to the stock price going up, you also get this free money. Uh, actually, it's not free money, it's dividends from the company. And then you have the detailed financial statement. So basically this is a financial statement that shows 2016, 17, 18, 19, and 20. It tells you what the sales is, which same as revenue. So that's gone from about $215 billion to $274 billion over a five year period. That's a lot of money. Um, their pre-tax uh, pre income goes from 61 billion to 67 billion. And then uh, you can see that their um, net income, this is their income after they pay taxes, went from 45 billion to 57 billion. So that's their, what we call profit and loss statement. Then this asset statement. So this basically talks about how much uh, current assets, which is, is um, your short-term assets, Apple has on hand about $143 billion. They have some long-term assets, which is uh, uh, another $180 billion. And then they also have some debt. They have $358 billion of debt. And the difference between their assets and their liabilities is really, you know, their, um, really their net worth, so it's their shareholders' equity. So that's a, that's a $65 billion right there. And finally, uh, this is the cash flow statement. So this is really the cash flow from operating activities. So it shows that Apple generates about $80 billion of cash a year. That's a lot of cash. Uh, obviously, they have spent some of that cash buying back stock. So you can see, um, actually, this is this line. So this is the slide that shows the number of shares outstanding in Apple is actually 21 billion back in uh, 2016. And now it's only 16.9, it's now 17 billion. So they actually bought back 4 billion shares of stock. And that's where some of that cash went, you know, that free cash flow. A lot of it went to, to, to buying back stock and that actually makes the company more valuable. They went from 21 billion shares outstanding to 16 billion shares outstanding. They actually increased the value of the stock by about 20% just by buying back stock. 
So next, I'd like to introduce you to Kathy Wood. She's actually very, um, I guess they call her a rock star stock picker. She managed about $60 billion. It's called the ARK Investments. Um, let me see, what else? So her flagship uh, ETF is called ARK Innovation and it returned 45% over the last five years. That's very impressive. So you know, she's one of the ones that's a big promoter of uh, Elon Musk Tesla. She really believes in uh, electric cars. She thinks that Elon Musk's company will be worth $3 trillion someday. So here's a slide about, and this is a, so I screen for the top ETFs over the past five years. And what's very impressive is number one, number two, number three, and number 11 are uh, from Kathy Wood's company, ARK Investments. Now, if you look at their five-year return, uh, it's 48%, 44, 38, and 33%. Those are extremely impressive returns over a five-year period. However, I do not recommend you invest in them, partly because they've only been around for seven years. They started in 2014. It's only 2021 now. I like a 10-year history. So um, you can see that if you did invest in them at the beginning of this year, uh, even though they've enjoyed 40% of five years, they've only got 3% in the last uh, year to date. They got uh, a minus 2% on this one uh, in year to date. They have minus 8% on this one year to date. And they have a 10% gain on this one year to date. So it just shows you the five years is really, really good. But if you had a really good five years, you may be in store for a little bit of a, um, they call it a, uh, a pullback. So they're, they just, I mean, they're still doing very, very well, but they've obviously had a pullback this year and that's fine. Um, I'm sure that in two or three years when they get a 10 year track record, I will be recommending them. You can see in this list companies I do recommend. So Sox is on here, SMH is on here, PSI is on here, XSD, PTF. Those are all stocks in my portfolio, or all ETFs in my portfolio. So let me have uh, Kathy Wood introduce her fund in her own words. ARK is a global investment firm, and we are focused only on disruptive innovation. That's our sole focus. We believe that investors are missing out on some amazing opportunities out there just because of how the traditional financial world is set up. It's very siloed, specialized in a world where technology is permeating every sector and innovation platforms are converging. DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology. These are the five major innovation platforms today that are evolving at the same time. We have never seen this amount of innovation evolving at the same time in history. So, unlike um, the Motley Fools and Louis Navalier, she focused on innovation as a key concept for selecting stocks that will rise in the future. So she talked about innovation. And quite simply, she believes that if you innovate, you will get better technology and that will disrupt the market that you're in and create more value for shareholders. And that value will lead to an increase in the price of stocks. So three examples, you know, Tesla, obviously, they, they innovated in the electric car area and that stock is done extremely well. Uh, Amazon innovated in, in uh, retail commerce. So they went, uh, um, they went using the internet as opposed to brick and mortar. They've done very well. Um, Netflix innovated in uh, video streaming. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, the leader in video was Blockbuster. You know, they were a huge company, you know, with a store, you know, with, stores on every corner that you could you know, rent a VCR, go home and watch a movie. Well, Netflix completely wiped them out and Blockbuster is basically out of business and Netflix has led the video streaming market and that obviously is innovation. So here's a James Wang. He's an analyst at, uh, at ARC and let's hear him talk. ARC is not your traditional investment. Most firms are managed around sectors 
market cap or pre-existing industries. We're really focused on figuring out where the world's headed through the key technology platforms of these. We're trying to deal with much larger narratives. We're trying to figure out what is the world of transportation going to look like five to ten years from now? How much energy is going to be generated and stored using the solar or lithium-ion battery cells? How much of software is going to ship over to artificial intelligence over the next ten years? We're trying to figure out the macro trends of technology over the next five to ten years, and that's much more exciting than maybe working out the minutia of the next quarter or so. So. Arc wrote a report, Arc Investment, called Big Ideas 2021. This is one of my favorite reports for providing investment information. It discusses important innovations in the world today and how they can affect your investment ideas. So I've read this report、um, many, many times over the past you know, year, and every time I read it, I find new ideas and I learn new things. So, I'm asking you to read this report. But if you don't understand all of it when you read it, you know that's really fine. That's okay. I don't understand all of it either. Just focus on the topics that that you understand and that you're interested in.、Uh, that I've put that、um, article or that report in this month's BAM folder.、Um, so I'm have another video from Kathy Wood, and then I'll provide a quick overview of this report. Traditional investment firms are having trouble, we believe, understanding the magnitude of the innovations that are taking place today. Investment firms that are not set up appropriately to analyze and research and invest in disruptive innovation are going to be depriving investors of some of the biggest opportunities of our lifetime. So this is the cover to the Big Ideas 2021 report from Ark Invest, and they also have a lot of disclaimers saying that you know that you know the numbers may be wrong. It's just a forecast, so they they want to be on the safe side that you don't you know assume these are completely correct, and you shouldn't assume they're completely correct. They're really meant to, to be、uh, ideas that that will allow you to think and you know listen to other people. Try to triangulate. You'll never go with you know one source of information. Uh, uh, get it from two, three, four sources, and triangulate before you、uh, make any investing decisions. So here's the table of contents, and、um, I'm going to talk about some of these in a little more detail. But basically, the ones I'm going to focus on the one that I, that I really、uh, like is the deep learning, which is about artificial intelligence, talking about、uh, reinventing the data center. So、uh, you know where. All companies do their number crunching. That's being reinvented. Virtual worlds, which includes virtual reality, includes、uh, augmented reality. But、uh, you know, all the, the they talk about third place that people go. You know, people go home, they go to work, and they'll go to a virtual world. Then there's this concept of digital wallets. I'm sure many of you are Venmo or、um, Cash App, but those are the ways people are.、Um, Putting money and using money these days. There's two sections on Bitcoin, which are very interesting. Section on electric vehicles, section on automation, which is robotics and、uh, different ways of automating factories. One on autonomous ride hailing. So this is the concept here: is that、uh, instead of calling Uber, you would call one of these、uh, cars with no driver. They'll come pick you up, drop you off where you want to go, and it's safe. You have delivery drones, which is you know Amazon. Instead of shipping through you know, the UPS, they will have a drone come to your door and drop off something. They talk about orbital aerospace, so this obviously includes、um, you know people spending two hundred fifty thousand dollars to go orbit the Earth, and also includes、uh, satellites in space, etc. And then number fourteen, which is multi-cancer screening. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So, according to、um, the analysts at Arc, deep learning、uh, could be the most important software breakthrough of our time. So that's quite a powerful statement. This is also their number one big idea. So, taking a step back, you know, until recently, humans, the people, wrote all software. That's just the way software. You know, if you need a software, you hire a program to write it for you. 
With deep learning, um, it's a form of artificial intelligence uh, that uses data to write software. So by automating the creation of software, deep learning could turbocharge every industry. So the idea is that you're using data to write software can be done in every field, in every area. And that's what makes it so impactful. Uh, the next statement is according to ARCS research, deep learning will add 30 trillion dollars to the global equity market during the next 15 to 20 years. Just to put that in perspective, um, I think in, in 2020, which was last year, the entire stock market was worth $80 trillion. So to be able to add another $30 trillion to that through this technology uh, is really, really quite a remarkable investment opportunity, almost growing the entire stock market by 40% because of deep learning. So this is a nice uh, quick slide that talks about you know, how software was written by people up until 2015 and then starting 2020, they started uh, using deep learning. Uh, you know, all the large websites have started to use uh, machine learning and, and uh, deep learning to write software using data. So you no longer have people writing the software, you've got uh, data that you gather to train the computers. So just three simple examples of how AI is changing the next generation of computing platforms. So I'm not sure if you have a Google Home or Alexa, but all those, or in Siri, all those computers that you talk to, that's all driven by deep learning. Um, when you ask your, your Google Home, you know, what's the weather? It knows what you're asking, it looks up its database and it answers you. Um, it's very impressive. Uh, Self-driving cars, we talked about this a little bit, but the Waymo was used to be a, a division of Google, uh, Google automated driving. They spun out a few years ago and they have actually clocked, uh, I think about 200 million miles uh, with self-driving cars already. So uh, very impressive. That's all done with deep learning. And then TikTok, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, has grown dramatically partly because they recommend videos based on a deep learning algorithm. Uh, companies like Pinterest who've grown very nicely and Snapchat grown very nice have been eclipsed by the power of deep learning uh, that's done by TikTok, very impressive. This slide actually talks about the amount of money it takes to train uh, these or, or do deep learning training. And this is a, what I call log scale. So every uh, every half an inch or so is a hundred times more. So this goes from one hundred to ten thousand to a million to a hundred million. And so you can see that uh, as time goes on, the amount of money required. So for instance, you could train someone in uh, you could train a program in twenty fourteen with a hundred dollars. In 2020, it would cost a million dollars to train GPT-3. That's uh, the order of magnitude. It's almost like a, I don't know, 10,000 times more cost. And then if you go a little bit further in the future, you're talking about, I don't know what that is. That's $10 billion to train in, in this time frame. So that's just showing you how you need more and more power to create these deep learning artificial intelligence programs. Um, this is talking about uh, compute time. So, you know, Tinge is doing 10 times more compute time in order to, to, to so today, you know, companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and OpenAI are, you know, using deep learning to understand language. And then in the future, it'll be research organizations doing research learning. It, it just shows um, an explosion of compute time necessary to do things. This is GP3, which is the first artificial intelligence unsense language. So if you give it like this very complicated legalese, it will read it and then they'll convert it to something everyone can understand. So 
This is basically legal lease about liquidation preferences. If a startup is wound up, the Series A investors will get paid back at least what they invested, and they will also share any leftover assets when they're shareholders. That's what that says. No one can understand that, but GPT-3, using deep learning, can read that and, and give you something that most people can understand. So it also writes emails, it can design web pages, can write code, can retrieve historical facts, can translate languages, diagnose diseases, converse with us as a therapist and more. So this is a very, uh, this is an unbelievable um, project and it's seeing a lot of progress, GPT-3. This just talks to how deep learning is creating a boom in AI chips. You know, when I talk about SOX, which is a semiconductor manufacturer, um, that's why there's a chip shortage and that's why uh, there's a boom in chips is because all of this needed to do deep learning. So here's where it talks about the internet going from zero to 13 trillion market cap, and then uh, in 2020 and by 2037, it'd be 20 trillion in market cap, which is still very nice. But deep learning is about two trillion market cap today. It will grow to 30 trillion. That's a growth of 14 times by year 2037. So this is the internet wave, and this is the deep learning wave. So that's a 37% increase in the size of the stock market just on deep learning technology alone. So reinvention of the data centers. So what are the data centers? They're the power plants of computation. You know, in the old days, it used to be IBM mainframes. Then uh, for the past 20 years, it's been Intel machines. They're saying that it's going to be off of Intel and move on to ARM and RISC-V RISC technology. And this will actually grow 21% annually until it gets to 41 billion by year 2030. Um, so this is where they talk about that 21% going from 6 billion to 41 billion uh, for, uh, let me see, what is, oh, that's for the accelerator. So that's like a GPU or some type of accelerator. So they're basically saying that the main CPU will be flat, storage will grow uh, 50%, uh, I'm sorry, memory will grow 50%, storage will grow 50%, uh, others will grow from 15 to 21, but the bulk of the growth will go from 6 billion to 41 billion is the accelerator. This talks about um, x86 is the Intel chips going from 30 billion, uh, 30 billion, I guess, down to 8 billion, and then there'll be 19 billion of risk technology by 2030. And if you look at the accelerator revenue, this is where you get the six to the 41 and you will see that the, uh, the main CPU technology will be uh, pretty much flat. Virtual worlds talk about video games, augmented reality and virtual reality. So they believe that uh, this will grow from 180 billion today industry to a 390 billion industry by 2025. So that's a very interesting area to look at for investing. Digital wallets is, they're saying will represent a $4.6 trillion opportunity in your pocket. So this would include Venmo, Cash App, and people will move away from banks and move some or all of their money to these um, digital wallets. That's the uh, projection. So right now, people have averaged about uh, between 250 and 1900 today, and they think that will scale up to 20,000 per user uh, by the year 2025. That's only four years away, by the way. Electric vehicles. So we talk about uh, sales for electric vehicles increasing significantly. So they believe that uh, right now, there's about 2.2 million electric vehicles sold a year. That will get to 40 million units in 2025. So that's 
quite an incredible forecast for electric vehicles. So they talk about uh, uh, when gas power was down only 4%, electric was up 16% in 2019. And then in 2020, uh, gas powered cars went down 15% and electric cars went 33%. So that shows you that regardless of the environment, uh, electric vehicle is sales is growing. This also talks about how the price of a gas powered vehicle will, I'm sorry, electric vehicle will come down over time between 19 to 21, 23 to 2025 when it will be less expensive for a electric vehicle than a gas powered vehicle. So this talks about um, EPA, which is almost like a miles per gallon versus how quickly you can accelerate. And usually uh, cars over here that uh, get a good miles per gallon are very bad acceleration. Or you have cars like a Porsche, which is very good acceleration, but very bad in miles per gallon. You get the Tesla models out here, which are good in both. They're both good in acceleration and they're good in miles per gallon. So here's the uh, <laughs> compound energy growth of 82% between 2020 and 2025 for electric vehicles. Automation, uh, they talk about robots. And uh, this will, they believe will add 5% or $1.2 trillion to US GDP over the next five years. Orbital aerospace. So this talks about um, satellite connectivity hypersonic flights, and they think this will get to about $370 billion annually as, a, as an industry. Multi-cancer screening. So this talks about, um, so in, in, sounds like in 2015, it cost $30,000 to do this, uh, this blood test that by 2020, uh, should be $1,500 and then by 2025 be $250. So the price coming down would actually save 1.4 million human life years, um, lead to 66,000 fewer cancer deaths per year. So this is very impressive. It's also a $150 billion market. So this is the slide that talks about um, If you have a localized cancer, uh, which is about 60% of cases, only 70% of those people die. Uh, it's the cases that have metastasized. It's only 17% of cases, but because of metastasis, uh, that leads to one half the deaths. So they're talking about having a blood test that used to cost $30,000 in 2015 coming down to something very reasonable where everyone can use it and be able to re, uh, identify a, a, a cancer early before it's metastasized and really lead to more human life. So this is very impressive technology. So that's the uh, big ideas 2021. I want you to read it. If you don't understand, it, it's okay. Just, just flip through as quickly as you can. So here we are, We've, uh, we're almost complete. So our income, we're through 25%, expenses, we're through 25%, expand wealth, we are through 20%, we're halfway through 25%. We'll finish 25% next month. So it's time for our, our monthly BAM account update. So we did not have such a good month uh, this month, probably because the stock market has really uh, pulled back in the late September. So. This is as of September 30th. Um, I used to be all green. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have seven green and three red. Um, uh, because uh, the, the market's been dipping, I've now invested everything. So I invested actually $1,000 in the last 60 days. Um, at this point, I was up $82, seven winners, three losers. Looking over time, you can see how you know, I used to lose 3% and then uh, it just fluctuates. I was uh, as high as 21%, came down to 14% last month, and it's down to 4% at the end of September. But I'm not worried because uh, I believe that uh, 
you know, it fluctuates and remember, you know, 30% of the time it goes down. So um, it'll be fine. It, it will bounce back, I'm sure. So just reviewing today's session, we covered 15, 20, 25% of cut expense. We did expand wealth 25% module three. Uh, we talked about uh, long-term bullish analyst recommends stocks based on expectation that key metrics will improve over the next few years. And ARC investment invests based on company's ability to increase shareholder value based on innovation. So that's the two things we learned. And for homework, I want you to now go review session eight and nine. Uh, eight was the one on individual stocks one, nine was on individual stocks two. And I want you to read the uh, ARC's big ideas report in the BAM folder. And um, for the rest of the year, so next month I'm gonna do, I'm gonna complete expand wealth 25%. I'm gonna go over continuous improvement. And then December, I'm gonna put it all together and we're gonna get ready for the new year. And that's it. So. Uh, you can all unmute and uh, give me some input, which would be really nice. Let me stop sharing. Hi, everybody. Well, wow, everyone stay to the end. You guys are a good group. Hey, Mary. <laughs> I have about 20 slides. <laughs> Very good. I, 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 like, I, I like the arc. I like the arc. Yeah, I like them too. I like Cassie Wood. Oh my gosh. Very impressive. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. So what did you like the most about today's session? Oh my gosh. That, that's it. The arc, the big idea. I good. like the big idea. Good. All of them. Hey, Peter, you got to hear... Yep. With Without hearing the rehearsal, what do you think? Uh, it's good. It, it, it just uh, just reinforced some of the investment ideas, or, or we follow some of these people that that it just just take, takes a lot. It just takes a lot of work to. Uh, you, are you, you are floating. You are floating. <laughs> <laughs> I am floating. Yeah. It's good. It's good to float. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Do you like that? Uh, He's floating. He's floating. No, yeah. I'm sorry. What does that mean? Yeah. It, it's, no, I'm, I'm saying on a massage here. They didn't know what it was. I'm just, uh, it's, oh. it's a zero, zero, zero gravity. It's a zero gravity chair. <laughs> no, I'm floating. <laughs> I mean, the, the market has been like, like you know, retreating a little bit. So it's, yeah, it's important yeah. to. That, that, yeah. That's part of what I teach is that's okay. You're going to accept, you're going to expect that. That just comes yeah. to comes into territory, you have to just uh, you know, deal with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lost millions of dollars, but it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, it's okay because, you know. Okay. It's short term. It's funny money anyway, I want it. I made it, so, you know, it's funny money. So you make it, you give it. <laughs> Long term, it's up, it's okay. Yeah. You, you don't have to pay any taxes. You don't have to pay any taxes. If you lose it now, you don't have to pay any taxes. That's good. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lisa Ann, what'd you think? It was great. A um, lot of information and, you know, the, the whole tech thing and the, you know, the software and all that stuff that I didn't have, you know, really know a lot about. So that information is, is just a bonus to me. Most people don't know about that, Lisa Ann. I mean, I mean, well, I didn't know it. It, it's, now that I'm where I am in my life, I can start learning things before, you know, anybody who's raised kids and been a mother, you know, that was your life kind of a thing. No, I know. Well, your kids yeah. are grown now. They're all grown out of the house. My kids are all grown. Yes, they are. You know, and I have my house and I've cut all my expenses and gotten rid of all my credit cards and my car is <laughs> like a thousand dollars left to be paid off. So, um, Again, A plus. Lisa. That's an A plus. That's good. So I've, That's good. I've come a long way, and my investment stuff will start. You know, I'm thinking after the first of the year, um, I will start. You know, investing some some stuff now that I've gotten all that straightened away. Um, you know. So. Excellent. I'm so glad. Hey, yeah. Stephanie. Can we see you, Stephanie? 
Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm on my couch. Yeah. Okay. okay. Couch is okay. Oh, that's, that's very, very comfortable. Very nice. Mm. Did, you, did you like it, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you added it, some stuff from the rehearsal. Yeah. yeah. I didn't go through my numbers as much. I skimmed yeah. my numbers. Yeah, but, it was really good. I. You, hmm? You know, from coming to your sessions, I have been, I don't know what's come over me, but now I check my portfolio every day. And before I check <laughs> it, maybe like every few months. <laughs> oh, well, oh, today's okay. Yes, it's, just about a, it's just about the past like week or so I've been doing, so I don't know if it'll. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, if you look at it, it's good. If you don't, it's good too. It's, it's I, yeah, I... I have some arts for ETF. Uh, I have art ETFs, like I told you. And yeah, no, that arc is fine. It's just it was on the run, so yeah, it was bad. It'll be really. It might be good to buy more now because it's pulled back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I real, yeah, I, I'm gonna buy a little bit. More. I bought some too, and I'm down. It's okay. It's yeah. I'm such a terrible. Yeah, yeah it's very good though. Thank you. Lots of good general knowledge about understanding stocks. Cheryl Lynn, are you there? I am. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. You? Did you like today's session? Um, I always enjoy these sessions. Like I thought it provided a lot of good perspective. I think for me, it was more around the education side of things. Because again, especially if you haven't really dabbled into stocks, like I thought, ETFs was pretty good, but now just kind of thinking about individual stocks, but also thinking about how to select the right stocks and understanding kind of the trajectory of, you know, what to expect and kind of planning ahead, right? And thinking about some of those things, like I thought that was super, super insightful, right? Because again, I have a young son. So even thinking about planning for him and thinking about how to start investing for him, but thinking about like some of the future of what things are going to look like and planning ahead. So I thought this was super, super informative. A lot of information that I think requires another, a second, third, fourth run at this. <laughs> um, but I thought this was excellent. So thank you for that. Thank you. Hey, Chris, unmute, Chris. This is the famous Christopher Lee, my son. Hello. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? What do you good. think of the session? It's good. good. Um, good I, I don't have a webcam on my computer. I'm on my computer right now, so. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's okay. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, it was good. I, uh, I, 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 I mean, I've talked to you before about a lot of these things, so I was pretty familiar with a lot of the material, but it was, it was good. Actually, good hey, Chris, I'm going to do back testing next month. <laughs> okay. Is something you help me do? Yeah. I'm going to uh, share with the group. Okay. Cool. That's, my, that's one of the topics I'm going to do uh, back testing. Very impressive. Um, so, Chris, uh, did, did, did Stephanie convince you to come? I mean, you, you, you came to session one about in January. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't really keep track of it. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. Steph, Steph, Steph mentioned it to me. And so, uh, yeah, I oh, skipped yeah. climbing today to come. So, Steph wow, that's wow. a sacrifice. That's sacrifice. Stuff's a good sales. <laughs> I've been trying to sell Chris on this the whole year. And it's not a Stephanie finally says, hey, go on, you should come. And boom, he's there. That's impressive, Stephanie. That's, a, that's impressive. Have okay. you been trying to get him to come? I thought you just. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Christopher, then, 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 then you could play, uh, uh, play cats with us in a couple of weeks, too. <laughs> hey, Chris, we have a. Um, we have a um, Millennium Tower Invitational on October 17th. October 17th, okay. The sun Sunday. Sunday. Come, come. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, yeah I don't know if I have any plans. It'd be like one to uh, like one to seven, one to eight. Like, yeah, yeah. so eat lunch before you come because I don't want to okay. feed people. Okay. Any okay. other thoughts, everybody? Hey, you, I'm, I'm really, I'm so proud of you guys for, for making it for 10 months and i ran out of poems so i have to do the beatitudes <laughs> I, I, I love the beatitudes back in the you. 80s i'm talking about 1980 maybe six 
1986. I took the biathlon, I typed it in, in a very nice, you know, when they have, um, you know, those pretty papers for letters? Oh, yeah. Christmas, I got this gold thing on the side, and I typed it, I gave it, and then I framed it, and I gave it a lot of you for Christmas. Oh, that, that is a good way to cut expense. Actually, Mary was the one, the original, she used to type up the lyrics to all the songs from like 1960s and 70s. She had a big, thick book of it. Very nice. This was a time of no computers. I mean, five volumes of this stuff. Oh, do you still have it? Do you still have it, Mary? Yes, I do. Wow. <laughs> oh, let, you, you, is, you, you know, now you can rewind and you can listen to it. We have to catch it on the radio when right. it comes on. Right, right. Yeah, I yeah. I have yeah, the papers right, by yeah. my side, but when it comes on, we're going to Johnny. Do <laughs> <Lyrics back. laughs> so so the next time we come over. You have to flip to the right page and then go, Chad Johnny again. <laughs> wow, that's... It was a real job. A good time. That was, that was help. good time. All of us help. Phil help. But I'm the guy who uh, typed it and combined, and I would find photographs in magazines to match the song. <laughs> is, is it like an artistic? Is it like an expression of, of art and, and music? Is that what that is? I'm it's just it's crazy. a project. I get the, no, any that's artistic good. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would never advise anybody to do that. It's just way too much work. But that was my interest. I guess and that's his own reward. Mary, to this day, I, I, I love lyrics. So I, mean, I, I try to remember all the lyrics to songs. And I mean, it's, I love, I love, I love but it's probably because of you. I mean, I probably started when I was probably seven, eight years old or yeah. whatever. I was like, lyrics, lyrics mixed with songs. 